My first job is to welcome you all, in particular to welcome our colleagues from across the UK. The Institute of Public Health is an all-island organisation, so we regularly work with our, our colleagues in Ireland and Northern Ireland, but we also uh, think there's there's huge opportunities to learn about the work, particularly in, in the other devolved nations of the UK. So uh, we, we really appreciate the engagement uh, and the opportunity for reflection and for learning, sharing our learning and insights and sharing our our work that we're doing, uh, the wins, the fails and the and the, the challenges and opportunities um, within that. So I've just uh, put up here a overview of today's session. We tried to keep it short and sweet because I know everyone is very, very busy um, in their in their daily jobs. And it's a, a very busy time in, in tobacco uh, legislation across the UK, as well as in the development of uh, stop smoking um, services. So I'm just going to give you a very quick run through of our uh, session today. Um, as I mentioned, the Institute of Public Health informs public policy um, on the island of Ireland, and we we develop evidence, knowledge sharing, data analysis, and uh, comparative policy work to help support decision making um, around policy to reduce, improve population health and, and reduce health inequalities and uh, tobacco control is, is a key part of that. Um, so just in terms of your engagement today, it would be very useful if you could use the chat function to just give a very quick introduction to yourself, your name and your interest in this topic uh, and where you work. That would be very what would be very useful and it'll help other participants understand who is who's who's working on this topic across the UK and Ireland in, in what context. Um, we also have a Q&A function on the Zoom, which I hope you can you can use. And I'd ask you to post some questions in that. If you could let us know there's somebody in particular from our speakers today who you would like to see respond to that question or if you would like to see a response from uh, anyone or everyone who's presented today, that would be very useful. We have a moderator who will be looking after that Q&A function and I'll bring forward those questions in our in our discussion session at the end. Okay, next slide. So I suppose our context for today's session was we were asked by the Department of Health in Northern Ireland to look at the issue of smoking and mental health as part of their end of term review of their tobacco strategy. We did that by doing some uh, data analysis around the relationship between tobacco use and mental health using Health Survey Northern Ireland data. But we also did a sort of a rather rapid documentary analysis of what was being said about tobacco and mental health across the UK and Ireland in the tobacco control policy documents that were there and trying to look at some of the reporting that had happened on implementation to pick up what had happened during the term of those tobacco policies. And we published this report alongside the end of term review of the tobacco strategy um, by the department. OK, great. Next slide. So I'll give you just a very high level view around smoking and mental health in Northern Ireland. It'll come as no surprise, I'm sure, to, to a lot of you that there was a strong association between smoking and mental ill health in Northern Ireland. Around one in six people in these age 16 and older in the health survey in Northern Ireland were considered to have a possible psychiatric disorder. But among people who smoke, one in three had a possible psychiatric disorder, which really is something to think about in terms of the population that we're trying to engage with evidence-informed smoking cessation supports and services. We also found that the uh, level of smoking became even more prevalent when we had people who had more severe mental health symptoms and also who had clinical diagnoses of, of, um, of mental illness. Next slide. So when we looked at the the, the policy approaches across the UK and Ireland, these will be a little dated now um, because thank God we do make some progress on tobacco policies and legislation. But we looked at England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland and Northern Ireland and we looked at the Tobacco Free Ireland policy in uh, in Ireland and the, and the uh, very well documented implementation work conducted by the HSE through the track of tobacco free implementation plans. Uh, we looked at um, Smoke Free Wales. Uh, and their delivery plan. We looked at uh, what was then Raising Scotland's Tobacco Free Generation. I think that's been updated. Sheila can put me right on that. But at the time we were doing the work, that was what we were working off, which is a little bit 
behind some of the other ones and then the others catch up. And we also looked at the CAN review and the and the English um, strategy as well. And we'd obviously been working very closely on the Northern Ireland tobacco uh, end of term review of, the, of their 10 year tobacco strategy. So we, we we did a documentary analysis to look to see how was mental, mental health mentioned in these strategies? How was it understood? What evidence was used to, to describe this relationship, what actions were specified, whether there was a target set. These are the sort of set questions that we applied across all those policies. OK, next slide. So I, I, there is a lot of detail in that report, but I'm going to give you the sort some of the high level observations we had around the policies that were there. It was recognised that most tobacco control policies did acknowledge or recognise in some way that there was a strong relationship or association between smoking and mental ill health. And nearly all of those policies used certain forms of evidence to help understand that link and describe that link and configure potential solutions and actions from that. So that is good news. What the evidence that was most pre was most commonly surfaced in the policy documents was that people with mental health were not always getting the same support to stop smoking. Um, and that work seemed to have really cut through in relation to determining some of the policy, the policy actions that might be taken. We did note that none of the policies set a target for reducing smoking among people with, with mental ill health, which is something to reflect on, perhaps. But we did also see that particularly in England, they had included smoking in, 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 and uh, among people with mental ill health within some of their uh, surveillance work in terms of indicators at, at national and, and regional and local levels. So the English group had moved forward quite quite well, I think, with some of the, the data work on that. And whilst, while all of the policies seem to recognise that people with mental ill health were more likely to smoke and more likely to experience tobacco-related harm, only some of them moved to the place where they said, well, maybe we, they need to receive some form of additional priority, whether that was staffing, resourcing, training, data work, further research, et cetera. Next slide. When we looked, I think, in terms of Northern Ireland, we did see some knowledge gaps where we didn't have the same quality of data in relation to smoking and among people with sort of chronic enduring mental illness that they seem to have in, in some areas of Great Britain. And for those specific psychiatric diagnoses like schizophrenia or anxiety disorders or and so on, we didn't we didn't have that um, granularity. We only had smoking really relating to mental health symptoms rather than relating to specific psychiatric diagnosis. And um, whereas that data did seem to be available in, in other areas of the UK, we did see a big knowledge gap in that we had the area around smoking and mental health in children had seemed to be sort of not looked at in relation to to this issue across uh, the UK and Ireland um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that work that we followed up on that later on and we, we did see that there was a change over time the more recent the policy document the more likely it was to afford a higher level of recognition to mental ill health and frame responses at a sort of population level as well as just the actions that the health service could take so did we need better data did we need better consultation people providing services or service users? Did we need better design and awareness campaigns? So the more recent policy documents were pushing forward on this. We did see some examples, um, particularly in Ireland, around engagement with mental health service users. This was growing, but it wasn't universally or consistently applied. And I don't think there was a set best practice around how that would be progressed. And we saw a focus on the training of mental health service providers in providing stop smoking services as the sort of the core response that was really prioritised across all jurisdictions. Um, and we also saw an emphasis around creating smoke free environments in mental health services as well. But there was surprisingly little hard data on how well that was going. OK, next slide. So I suppose some of the considerations that were sort of surfaced for us looking at this in the context of Northern Ireland was, you know, what are the best buys for investments that we could be making to address smoking among people with me mental ill health? And what what sort of policy measures might be needed in terms of prevention as well as in terms of response? So that was a question that we didn't really have a good answer to. Um, certainly the, the impact of the broad tobacco control measures and how they might affect people with mental ill health wasn't really 
wasn't really done um, as far as we could see. So I th that was something we really needed to reflect on. Shouldn't people with mental health be a target group within policy? Is it possible to do that within data? Is it is that a practical thing to do? Is that a useful thing to do? These were some of the questions that were surfaced. I don't have the answers to them. <laughs> we had a question then, I think, on an operational level about building effective partnerships between smoking cessation and mental health service development and integration of service quality as well as integration of priorities within that space? Are the priorities for people in smoking cessation going to be taken on by people in mental health services? Are there priorities for people in mental health services? Can they be integrated into how we do smoking cessation and how do we find a place where we can work together? And then how, how can we modify and make perhaps our work on public awareness and messaging to engage people with mental ill health and to tackle maybe some of the misperceptions or the barriers that they may be having in accessing services? And is there a need potentially to have a, a change of thinking in terms of the model of stop smoking support? Do people with mental health need a different model or is it the same model? at greater intensity? Do they perhaps need longer follow-up times? Do they have perhaps need more attention to, to the medication interactions? Um, and those sort of questions were were, were definitely um, coming out um, uh, coming out in the in the work. And as well as you know the the long-term goal, which would be to reduce smoking uh, and reduce the tobacco related harms experienced by people with mental health, do we need to be more realistic about the place we're in right now, where we have a, high, a population with high smoking prevalence who may be also struggling to access uh, cancer screening, who may also be struggling to have their health issues listened to and referred to services, um, for example, in relation to the risk of lung cancer, heart disease, poor oral health and things like that. So is there a role perhaps for moving forward smoking cessation alongside better detection and screening for a population we know at this time is right now experiencing a very high level of smoking related disease and disabilities that are maybe we need to look after that as well as looking after the cessation piece and um, so they were i guess some of the questions that that, that had been uh, surfaced through our work uh, i'll move on to the next slide and I, I guess we followed up a little bit on the mental ill health, tobacco and younger people piece. Um, I've just put a few findings in there. The first one is by just a very recent study published by uh, Joan Hannafin and colleagues in the Tobacco Free Research Institute in Ireland that looked at 20 year olds and the relationship between mental ill health and, sm and smoking in 20 year olds. And also some work that we had done around the Young Persons Behaviour and Attitude Survey, which is 11 to 16 year olds in, in Northern Ireland. And you can see there that this relationship between tobacco and mental ill health is already there from the beginning. So there's something about smoking initiation and changing from experimentation perhaps to being a regular smoker and mental health is is involved in that as well so i guess from a public health point of view we need to think about that beginning of that relationship as well as what it looks like in our adult population as i said we're we're here to uh, listen and share what we've been doing and um, what, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities we face in this work. And uh, I've probably posed more questions than than answers on, on this, um, but I hope we've provided a space today for people involved in tobacco control, in mental health services, in mental health policy, mental health service users and the, the specialists that care for them to have to have a, a little bit of reflection on this and to, to as I said, to share uh, what we have done. So I'm going to hand over to Martina Blake and Martina is the National Lead for the Health Service Executive or HSE in um, Ireland and she leads on our Tobacco Free Ireland programme and she's going to share some of the work that, that has been done uh, in Ireland and hopefully share some of her views and opportunities and challenges within that. Brilliant. Okay, over to you Martina. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks a million Helen and thanks for the invite. Um, so as Helen said, I work in the in the HSC and I lead out a, a small team um, in the Tobacco Free Ireland programme and we're responsible for sub smoking service delivery, Tobacco Free Campus and um, kind of, I suppose, improving the, the environment around tobacco control, both internally in the HSC and externally. Um, and we work under the, the Tobacco Free Ireland government policy, which is kind of nearing um, the end date, 2024. 
2025 was published in 2013 and the overall goal of that policy is to reduce smoking prevalence down to less than five percent obviously to normalize tobacco use within Irish society reduce initiation uh, rates and uh, try and help smokers to quit uh, and protect young people that's a kind of key theme throughout that policy um, in terms of um, protecting children from secondhand smoke and uh, from becoming smokers themselves so our um our overall aim, I suppose, in the program itself, uh, so we work across those themes, denormalizing smoking for the next generation. A lot of that work is around our work in kind of, I suppose, implementing and quality improving tobacco free um, policies within the organization ourself um, and working with external stakeholders like local authorities, uh, sporting organizations to try and um, encourage them to develop smoke free policies to further denormalize smoking across society. Um, and, you know, the other thing I suppose that we do is, is try and train and support our healthcare professionals and our clinicians um, to understand tobacco dependence treatments to understand best practice in that um, and to acknowledge tobacco use as a disease and treat it um, and we produced clinical guidelines around that in January 2022 and we're in the busy implementing those or trying to implement them um, providing cessation support um, so we um, are obviously responsible for the national quit line and coordinating and supporting our stop smoking service delivery across community and acute organizations I and mean, I'll talk a little bit about that later on um, and then I, I talked about tobacco free environments so where are we in Ireland in the Republic in terms of smoking prevalence? We have reduced smoking prevalence over the last 10, 15, 20 years, but unfortunately you can see there in the last four years, it's stalled. It's still at 18%. We cannot seem to get it below 18%. Um, higher smoking prevalence um, among those who are disadvantaged, 14% smoking daily, 4% um, occasionally, and highest among our young population, 25 to 34 year olds. Um, higher among unemployed, 40% versus 17% um, for those who are employed. And, and, and probably we'll see the same experience when, when um, uh, you know, we hear present presentations from Scotland, Northern Ireland and, and Wales. Um, it's usually very socially patterned. Um, E-cigarette use growing. Um, among the general population, even in, in one year from 2022 to 2023, went from 6% to 8%, but uh, much higher among 15 to 24 year olds, 20% uh, 20, 20 of women and 16% of men, which is a really, um, I suppose, complicating factor in terms of, you know, we know from the evidence that e-cigarette use, one in five young people who use uh, e-cigarettes have the potential to go on and use tobacco in, in, in the future. So this has, has the potential to scupper all of the good tobacco control work that we've done and, and all of the work we've done to try and reduce smoking prevalence among uh, young people. Um, and then for those with mental health difficulties, um, smoking, you know, more than double or almost double. And um, there's lots of different surveys with different data, but almost double the general population. So we are really at risk of leaving that vulnerable population group behind if we don't have targeted approaches. Um, so this is just kind of, I suppose, referencing a number of different studies. Um, Royal College of Psychiatrists, you know, acknowledged in their 2013 report about, uh, you know, the people with mental health challenges recognised with high smoking prevalence. Um, An Ed Burns study in a, a particular unit here in Dublin, um, uh, you know, uh, recognised or, or did a survey of smoking prevalence and found it was 34 percent. We've been uh, engaging with the Mental Health Commission over a number of years, and they did a survey in 2018. Susan Finnerty now retired, but she um, did a study um, on one day looking at sm um, smoking prevalence within all of the approved units um, that are inspected by our Mental Health Commission and found that smoking prevalence was 38%. Um, and then we did secondary analysis from Healthy Ireland data. Now, they don't ask... Um, people with, you know, the question around probable mental health problems in every Healthy Ireland survey. So they, they only do that every couple of years. But um, the last year that we have data from was 2015. I think they did it in 2022, but we haven't done that secondary analysis yet. Um, and in that, we cross-referenced it with smoking data and found it 35%. So you can see it varies there, 35 to 38%, but, but double or, or almost double the general population. So we know that people who smoke have um, 
have mental health difficulties and have poor mental health. So um, smoking directly impacts our mental health because it impacts on our sleep, our sleep quality, our endorphins and our reward pathway. Um, and obviously smoking is detrimental to our physical health. I don't think there's any organ in the body that isn't impacted by smoking from our heart, our lungs, um, our skin, our hair, our teeth, everything. Um, and, uh, you know, one in every two long term smokers will lose 10 to 15 years of quality life. Um, and, and those final years are usually very, very difficult because they're suffering from chronic disease, unfortunately. Um, so. Uh, you know, poor physical health then leads to poor mental health. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of situation here. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of challenge. Um, smoking obviously increases also um, the risk of developing severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia um, and depression. So are people uh, with, uh, you know, lived experience of mental health able to quit smoking? Of course they are. And we've lots of studies to tell us that they are um, capable of quitting and, and want to quit as well. But often our clinicians ignore the fact that they're smoking, don't ask those questions, have this kind of idea that they can't, they can't quit. Their mental health is too, um, it's too bad at the moment. They're, they're in an acute phase and they, and they don't even engage the individual um, in this agenda, which is really challenging um, and, and something we need to address through our clinical guidelines and through our training. Um, so uh, the, the other thing I suppose just to remember is that tobacco smoke itself interacts with some of the psychiatric medications, so antipsychotics, antidepressants, hypnotics and, and anxiolytics. So that means that what it does is it makes these drugs metabolize or break down faster, making them less effective. So people who smoke and are taking these medications need more medications. That has the risk of side effects, obviously, um, because the more medication you need, the more risk of side effects from those medications. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely in someone's interest to try and quit smoking. But we know that smoking and quitting, sometimes kind of it's a, a quitting and relapsing back to smoking. That's the bit that needs to be challenged. So if somebody quits and relapses, we need to be really careful that their medication dose is titrated back up again um, and, and carefully monitored through it. That's a, we, we, need, we have a body of work, I suppose, to educate our clinicians around that. Um, so we developed, as I said, clinical guidelines. Um, well, they were published by the Department of Health, but we would have done the work in, in here in HSE on, on the evidence review and, and those clinical guidelines. Um, so they're, they're um, uh, endorsed by the minister. And what those clinical guidelines say is that healthcare providers should offer counselling and, and pharmacotherapy, so medication and treatment for people who smoke and have a mental illness. Um, and uh, that that will, will you know, and we and also in the guidelines, it recognised that, um, you know, I suppose smoking prevalence, which is higher among those with um, lived experience of mental health difficulties, reinforces health inequalities. So we know that smoking in and of itself um, increases uh, health inequalities. Um, and so, so, you know, it's, it's really important if we're interested in addressing health inequalities, we have to address smoking. We, we absolutely need to. So those recommendations were, were, were specifically for, for clients within secondary mental health services. Um, and we know that that actually is only a very sm small cohort of the population that have mental health difficulties. 80% of people who have mental health difficulties are treated within the community, but they apply outside as well. Um, and the guidelines apply to the general population as well. So we should ask and document the smoking behavior and we should refer and provide sub smoking um, a treatment um, for, for, um, for people with, with lived experience. So what have we done to, to try and implement those guidelines? and try and improve the delivery of stop smoking services. So we were really lucky, I suppose, to, we put in um, estimates, bids, and I'm constantly putting in bids for more money um, to try and improve services. So we put in a, an estimates bid into the department. Um, it would have been in 2021, um, 2022, around the time the guidelines were being published to seek further investment and to seek improvement in stop smoking care. Um, and we had a targeted approach whereby we were investing in specific in 
inequalities and, and uh, uh, communities that had particular disadvantage. So we identified 20 of those Sloan to Care healthy community areas that, that we identified and we put investment not only in smoking care, but across other programs, parenting programs, um, healthy food made easy, nutrition programs, alcohol, other areas as well. But for smoking, we put one WT or one stop smoking advisor in each of these areas. And we set, uh, we, we um, required those uh, uh, service delivery uh, partnerships to um, set up clinics addressing specifically mental health, our, our clients with mental health difficulties, maternity and acute services. Um, we also sought funding to provide free nicotine replacement and not just nicotine replacement, but all stop smoking medications. But at the moment, only nicotine replacement is available. We, we think that Renathan is going to shortly come back on the market, but um, at the moment it's combination nicotine replacement. So we got money for nicotine replacement initially just for these slaunch care areas, but now we have um, new funding for addiction replacement for anyone and everybody who comes into a stop smoking service. And I just heard yesterday that we got some extra money to deliver that for next year because we haven't got enough um, because we're seeing more people come to the service. So that's wonderful news. Um, we also included in this program one day per week um, to, to kind of work around tobacco free environments and work with those local communities to try and change the culture and denormalize smoking and try and improve tobacco free. We Can Quit is another program that got invested in throughout that uh, through that funding. So it's a it's a seven to 12 week peer led stop smoking group support program. So we train lay health advocates within the community to deliver stop smoking care um, and, and group support. And that uh, is working really, really well um, also. This is just a figure of our, you know, just identifying our stop smoking service and, and the growth. So you can see there the yellow line is this year. So, you know, we are growing in terms of the number of people that we're seeing through our service. And last year we had a record year where we saw almost 20,000 people and we, we exceeded our target for the first time in the history of my work in tobacco control, which was unbelievable. Um, we got 102 percent um, of our target. So, you know, we know that's that nicotine replacement, when you remove the barrier, the financial barrier for people um, to access stop smoking care and, and you, you build the service, they will come. If you put the staff in and you engage and have targeted approaches, um, clients will come to service. So that was really, really positive. So what have we done to engage mental health staff and um, people with lived experience of mental health difficulties and their advocates and family members in terms of tobacco control? So this is 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 not a one day event. It's a it's a an ongoing process. Um, so through our own program plan, we have a number of actions. So we, we've uh, I've listed in their actions 18 and actions 20 to 26, where we specifically call out um, work that uh, that we we plan to do and we have been doing um, to target this population group. We've been working with Mental Health Ireland for for a long time to um, I suppose start the conversation around tobacco management within mental health and start the conversation around tobacco control and smoke cessation services. We hosted a national conversation cafe a number of years ago. We had um, people who smoke, people who don't smoke, people who've quit, um, their family members, service users, staff, men, you know, um, members of the public and the Minister for Health at that event. Um, and it was, you know, a conversation cafe around, around smoking, around smoke cessation, around how we, we target and and, uh, and support. We've produced a number of different kind of resources and, and, and uh, different programs, I suppose, that we run as well to try and engage the community. So we have a strong emphasis on tobacco-free um, policy implementation. We have a, a toolkit there. You can see how to implement tobacco-free across the service. Um, we've run a bursary initiative, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but we produced a, a book of abstracts in 2019, which describe some of the work that some of the services have done to, to, to tobacco manage in their services. And there's some mental health sites featured within that. Um, 
we produced that smoking cessation and mental health document, a briefing for frontline staff. Um, and we're just about to publish a new booklet, uh, which we wrote in conjunction with Mental Health Ireland, um, people with lived experience. Um, so quit smoking a guide for people accessing mental health services. Um, so uh, it's not it's not off the press yet, but in draft, nearly there. Um, so so uh, yeah, we're very excited about that piece as well. Um, we, we also worked with the National Forensic Hospital in, in uh, Dublin uh, to implement tobacco free and back in 2020 we hosted a webinar where um, Frank Lynch, who was the lead there, um, kind of talked about his experience of implementing a completely tobacco free site within that site. Um, so uh, we, we actually had a visit there very recently, only about two weeks ago, with international colleagues from the Global Network of Tobacco Free Health Services that wanted to come over and see how they've implemented tobacco free and what their experience has been. And we heard from um, some, some clients who, who are accessing the service about their journey and experience of quitting, which was really, really powerful, actually. Um, as I said, we've, we've been working with the Mental Health Commission and Susan Finner, she was a, a really strong advocate in this space. Um, we've had a number of meetings with uh, the Mental Health Commission over the last four or five years to try and engage them on this agenda. Uh, we did some training with all of their inspectors, their Mental Health Commission inspectors, to support them in understanding how the, what the, T, the HSE, Tobacco for Campus policy, was about and how to, to understand that a bit better. Um, and they did the survey and then they published this, this uh, publication, Physical Health of People with mental, uh, Severe Mental Illness, uh, subsequently. Um, so within services, we've been engaging with mental health services, although I think that could improve. We were really disappointed with the sharing the vision report that didn't call out tobacco use and smoking prevalence specifically, which we felt it should do. I know there was reference to physical health and, and promoting mental health and all of that. But uh, I think because smoking prevalence was so is so high and such a um, you know, an important agenda, it really should have been called out, even though we had um, advocated for that during the drafting of Sharing the Vision. So the new Sharing the Vision that will come out, we would hope will have a specific remit and call out uh, smoking and tobacco prevalence and actions to address that. But there's been a number of, I suppose, since the publication of Susan Finnerty's report, are Thanks, you, Martina. I'm just a little bit over time. If I can okay, ask you to okay. move on. Thanks. Move on. Okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, this is just some of, some of the resources that Stop Smoke or the, the mental health services have developed to look at physical health. Um, this is just some of the um, new um, information around smoking and mental health that we put on our public facing website. I talked about tobacco free campus policy and how important that has been in terms of growing um, and engaging mental health services in tobacco control. There's eight standards. I would encourage any organization who's not involved in the global network of tobacco-free health service to get engaged. Um, and if you follow these standards, you can really implement tobacco-free very, very well. We've run this bursary process whereby we've incentivized um, tobacco-free campus quality improvement over a number of years. The first year we started 2018, 2019, and last year. And we've seen, uh, so basically what they do is kind of develop a quality improvement plan, implement better quality, better um, policy, um, and then are up for an award of up to 5,000. And they use that war that money to improve tobacco um, signage or, or other areas within their service. Um, and we've seen a growth in mental health engagement since we've introduced that. So the first time we did it, we had five mental health sites engaged. And last year we had 34 mental health sites engaged in that process. So that has really, really helped. Our problem is money for that. So I put in a bid for money for that. Fingers crossed, we'll get it uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so in summary, you know, is there hope? Is there choice? Can you take back control? Is recovery possible? Um, do you allow your illness to define you? Do you allow smoking to define who you are? This is some of the kind of questions that came out through our conversation cafe. And is smoking cessation achievable for people with lived experience and mental health difficulties? We know it is. We know it can happen. We have testimonial evidence from that of people who've come to our service. So um, a lot done, more to do. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll shut up now. <laughs> and, and Great. Thanks, brilliant.
Thanks very much, Martina. Um, I can. Uh, I uh, it's great to see all the work there. What we might do is we will develop a resource pack based on the materials that have been shared today, and we can share that round with the uh, participants. Just a reminder: if you have any questions, to post them in the Q and A function, and we'll try and get to those in the discussion. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Colette Rogers, who's regional lead for Tobacco Control in Northern Ireland, the Public Health Agency, uh, to share her perspective on mental health and tobacco in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Um, lovely to hear Martina speak and finish with a message of hope on World Mental Health Day. Um, that we can. Um, this is this is all very possible, but it is very challenging. Um, so next slide, please. So the we have been fortunate in Northern Ireland, um, but it has been slightly painful. So we've had quite a significant magnifying glass. Uh, hovering over our work over the past year. Um, our tobacco strategy, as you'll see from the slides that Helen presented earlier, um, is quite dated, 2012. We are due to uh, develop a new strategy. We also had a full audit by the Northern Ireland Audit Office because we receive about 3.2 million of public money each year to implement the tobacco control strategy. So that looked at everything that we had done over the last 10 years and made 10 recommendations. Um, and we also had the piece which Helen has mentioned, um, which looks specifically at smoking and mental health. And that piece was commissioned by the Department of Health um, alongside the review and final report uh, of the implementation of the 10 year strategy. So we have a lot of stuff. We are our, our strategy is dated. We're due to rewrite it. But we also have a lot of these up to date documents that can help to inform what our recommendations and priorities are going forward. So I'm quite optimistic for the future because we had very little about mental health in the first document. Vaping wasn't even mentioned. Um, you know, this environment moves so rapidly, uh, as you all know, you're all, you're all very well, of, well aware of that. Um, and we, we may need to think about what's an appropriate time frame for a tobacco strategy is 10 years too long because the, the environment moves so quickly. So the, this has given us um, a blueprint really for moving forward. It outlines, and I mean, Helen has spoken to this already, but it, it illustrates the extent of the problem in Northern Ireland specifically. And we know many people in Northern Ireland already have poor mental health um, as a result of the conflict and history of the Troubles. We have quite a, a lot of issues with huge waiting lists. Um, so a lot of challenges that people are facing on a daily basis. Um, uh, and so I'm not going to at the minute our our prevalence rates or I don't want to replicate Helen what you had covered, but in Northern Ireland at the minute um we have about fourteen percent of the population adult population over the age of sixteen years smoking, which is about three thousand three hundred twenty thousand people, um but obviously fourteen percent prevalence amongst the general population, but you start looking at twenty four percent prevalence and upwards when you look at more deprived disadvantaged communities and then go into mental health issues. So next slide, please. So um, I thought this was maybe useful. Um, this 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 has come out of the um, the Northern Ireland audit report. Um, and it's just for yourselves to have a look at. Um, but it's the not just the health to individuals and their families, but the cost of the Northern Ireland economy and the health sector treat, treatment and care. So Department of Health estimates that local hospitals in Northern Ireland occur annual costs of around 218 million in treatment smoking related illnesses. In a time of <clears throat> um, reduced public funding, uh, this, this is really important for us to be considering. Um, within the Public Health Agency, we estimate with other factors, including premature deaths and excess sickness absence, that the local annual economic costs rising from smoking are about 450 million. So when you start to take all the factors in to Northern Ireland Incorporated, you're looking at 450 million, significant amount of money. Um, and the most recent, recent analysis shows that there's a, almost 35,000 smoking related hospital admissions recorded in Northern Ireland annually. Um, with 60,000 hospital bed days attributed to tobacco linked mental or behavioural disorder alone. Um, and we do have a move towards area integrated partnerships in Northern Ireland, which will be looking at population health approaches. Um, so some of these, this information is really quite um, important at the moment. Next slide, please. So um, another 
piece in Northern Ireland and we're all structured slightly differently. But I think we can drive from one side of Northern Ireland to the other in three hours. So we're not huge in terms of geography. Um, and we know our target population. And what that size does is means that, that we do work very collaboratively. We, we know each other, we work together very well, and we can come together on a regional basis relatively simply, um, which isn't always possible for, for other parts of the UK and the Republic of Ireland appreciate that. Um, one of the things that, one of the recommendations, so there were 10 recommendations in the Northern Ireland Audit Office report, and I'll, get, I'll provide you with all the links for these documents um, as part of the pack um, that, that Helena talked about earlier. But, you know, it, it it was very honest, I think is probably the best way of putting it. Uh, and But honesty means you know exactly and you have clarity on what the actions that are required. So I like honesty. Um, uh, and we know there's there's a lot of challenges ahead. But basically, we have probably like yourselves um, experienced a significant decline in the uptake of stop smoking services. So we offer a 12 week stop smoking service um, with free NRT across Northern Ireland in a range of settings. Uh, it's totally free to the client. They can receive two, up to two NRT products per week um, for the 12 weeks. Um, uh, and those services are delivered across pharmacies, community settings and trusts, a range, a range of settings. But we need to um, improve our uptake of these services. We need to establish why the uptake has reduced so, so steeply. I know we have the COVID effect, but we there's something more to it. And I think it's because we're looking at health inequalities and the harder to reach um, audience. And, I, and like yourselves, I would probably agree. It's not that the audience are harder to reach. It's just that our services need to be better able to outreach to them. Um, so we are looking across these five trusts at the minute if we can um, roll out best practice. Next slide, please. So in doing that, we had a workshop last week with the five trusts. Uh, and we were looking at good practice within the trusts, but also the challenges the health and social care trusts are facing. Um, and when we're looking particularly at smoking and mental health, um, you know, you guys know this already, 10 times more likely to develop um, lung, lung diseases, life expectancy will reduce for between 10 and 15 years, more likely to experience coronary heart disease um, and heart attacks and nearly 80% more at risk of developing Alzheimer's and other conditions. We do have a very willing mental health workforce um, where we have mental health nurses involved in stop smoking services. They really feel strongly um, and it reflects the information that's in the Institute's document that was produced in December, December 23. They really do feel that quitting smoking has been considered um, harmful or too challenging for people with mental ill health. This view is being challenged and it's been challenged at the moment by some folks within the health and social care trust settings. Um, but we need we need to sort of grow that um, that view and opinion uh, and support men, uh, support staff across the system to really help folks with mental health uh, diagnoses um, to quit smoking. Next slide, please. So what we have at the minute is, I mean, um, Helen has already indicated, we don't have a huge amount of investment in mental health side of the services. We're very, very willing to learn from yourselves about what works and what, what you've already implemented. So we have two mental health specialist nurses um, and, and we know and we recognise that we need to really wrap around those those individuals to help them to achieve a successful quit. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to. The They... Um, in terms of what has worked, um, so this we, we, we really looked at this in depth last week at the Five Trust workshop and the mental health stop smoking specialists were saying is really awareness and training across the workforce, um, really having that person centred approach um, and considering harm reduction when it comes to those with an enduring mental health illness. Abrupt quits don't work. Um, we need to really facilitate access to support for people and think about how, what, how do we make this as easy as possible for someone with a mental health condition or diagnosis to access services and stay with services? Um, and we need to look at enhancing the assessment of risk. So Martina talked about that, about interactions with other medications and things like that. The challenges um, have already been covered and I imagine they'll be consistent throughout our presentations. There's a perception that people can't quit and don't want to quit and won't quit. Um, 
folks with an enduring mental health condition will have more relapses before they reach their successful quit, but that's okay. It's about acknowledging they may have more relapses, um, but that you continue to support them to get to their successful quit. At the moment, they're less likely to receive help in NRT, so it's up the challenges for us to ensure that they do. Uh, and it's already been spoken about before. Some of the withdrawal symptoms from nicotine can mirror per mental health symptoms. So having a qualified mental health practitioner there alongside you means that that can be really looked at and see what's going on. Um, do, does your medication need to be adjusted? Do you require some extra support? Um, and our mental health specialists um, very clearly stated, you know, one of the bar some of the barriers are about making sure the person's in the right place at the right time um, to receive this support. You know, if they're in a mental health crisis, it's not the time. Um, but there are things that you can do to help build motivation, look at what their stressors are and improve concentration. So the timing is key. It would be one of the key messages there. Next slide, please. Um, so what worked? Um, so this is uh, the service is in its infancy, really, where we're trying to track the numbers at the moment. But there's certainly a lot of interest across the other trusts. And what we'd be keen to do is. If this works, we look to roll it out and scale it up, but very much the mental health nursing team um, felt that that these things were required when they were dealing with clients um, with a mental health condition. So. Providing a remote service uh, is one factor which is important, so there's no financial outlay for the client. Um, the needs of your audience in terms of how to be communicated with, so texting, voice notes for younger clients and acknowledging that there may be some social anxiety there. So how you engage with different age ranges is really important in this. Um, some older clients really prefer a uh, conversation by phone. They do not want to text. And I mean, I know this is common sense, but it's about reaching and landing with your target audience. Um, and they identify, they, they felt it was really important about identifying the client's stage of change um, and adapting to meet the person where they are at. Next slide, please. So, um, in, from the workshop last week, which brought all five trusts together and we had midwives and we had um, the mental health nurse specialists, we had the health improvement leads within the trust, we had a range of staff there um, and it was a very open, honest conversation um, and we were thinking about, well, what do we need to do to improve stop smoking services for people with a mental health issue? And we've come up with a list, which I'll not read down through, but it reflects some of the stuff that we've already talked about and you can have a look at it. But it's about pen, pe person centred. It's about challenging the perceptions that people can't quit. Um, and it's about simple, quick, easy access to, to nicotine replacement therapy. Next slide, please. So we have some opportunities. So um, every challenge, I think, is an opportunity. So we have some opportunities lining up in Northern Ireland, which makes this kind of an exciting time. So our assembly is back up and running. We have a draft programme for government that's out for consultation. We have a new health minister and his uh, primary focus is health inequalities. So we are liking the sound of that, given the, the, the overlap with smoking and, and health inequalities. Just we had left Colette, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we had the um, the middle report there is the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. Uh, it is available for everybody. It was published in January this year. I will send you the link. It had 10 recommendations. Um, and one of the recommendations, which really I think is exciting for us to take into consideration a new strategy, is should smokers with mental health problems be given priority status, uh, which is really relevant for our conversation today. Um, and uh, as I said, the 10 year tobacco control strategy ran out in March of 2024. Our department colleagues are really focused on the tobacco and vapes bill at the moment, but this is just paused, but we will pick this up again shortly. But we have a nice environment within which to draft a new strategy that's really ambitious. Um, so we have 17 recommendations that have come out of the review of that and the inst our institute colleagues were heavily involved in that work. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So we do have, we have another opportunity. Um, Martina talked about, I mean, one of the challenges is the, the data and tracking clients and see what works. We have a new system coming into play in Northern Ireland that is coming into all of the trusts and it's called Encompass. Um, and it's like, it replaces the electronic care record. So 
and it's been phased into each of the different trusts. Our Southeastern Trust has already gone live in November 2023 and what they recently did was presented to us on some of the data they can pull out around uh, stop smoking. So they can pull out referral rates internally within the trust setting. They can identify which teams are making referrals. They can track a cohort of patients. They can overlap that with um, health conditions. Um, this is quite exciting for us in terms of what we will be able to identify going forward. Obviously, there's confidentiality and la layers of access, but we'll be able to interrogate the data in a way we never did before. We'll see which clinical teams within the trusts are really excelling in referral to stop smoking services and are there other areas which really we need to focus. Um, so I think this is really quite exciting um, and we'll see see where we go with this. One trust, two trusts have gone live, the other three are yet to come on board. And here's what is already working from this system that's in its infancy. We can already spot the increased referral to stop smoking services within the trust setting. Um, you can easily access the referrals um, to inpatients and outpatients and you can see who has engaged with a particular client and what they have advised, so um, any challenges or issues. And this would be particularly relevant where somebody has a mental health diagnosis as well. Really simple referral mechanism. Uh, consultations are completed in real time and the sending letters across the system are electronically done to GP practices. So it's really quite an exciting development for us. Next slide, please, which is the end. Um, this is where you can reach me. Um, I'll share all of these links, but really excited to be involved in this conversation today because I think we have a challenging path ahead. But it's exciting. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Colette. Everyone is so enthusiastic on this subject. It's been fa fantastic. I've heard about a lot of things that I that I wasn't uh, a lot of a lot of things that I wasn't aware of, um, and a lot of those system issues that are are needed perhaps to move this issue along as well as the the, the leadership there by tobacco control and, and uh, smoking cessation. We have run a little bit over time, so I'm going to run our session about 20 minutes over to about 12.45 to give us a bit of space for discussion. I know not everyone can stay on, but we will have the recording. So for anyone who's not able to stay on, we can send you the recording and you can catch up on that on that last piece. So just a reminder as well, if you have any questions, post them in the Q&A and we'll bring them forward to the discussion uh, session and it is now my pleasure to welcome uh, Sheila Duffy who uh, I link with fairly regularly <laughs> on matters of devolved legislation. Um, she is Chief Executive Officer of Ash Scotland and she's going to share with us some of the work that's going on in Scotland. You're very very welcome Sheila and look forward to hearing from you. Okay so Ash Scotland is one of four UK art organisations which since the 1990s have been independent. There isn't an Ash UK voice um, and we have done a fair amount of work on mental health and smoking in the past. So we, we did impact, which engaged with community mental health services and people using those services. And that service that the message about the medication is one of the strongest ones for motivating people to think about quitting smoking. We published a mental health and smoking report in 2022, and that forms the bulk of these slides. And, um, we have an ongoing interest in, in health inequalities and this clearly qualifies. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these uh, slides because you'll be able to have access to them if you need them and the uh, links and references are in the uh, notes for the slides. So just to start, we use the Scotch Health Survey data. It tends to reach communities that are underserved in uh, ONS and so forth, but the information on smoking and mental health isn't routinely published. Our 2022 report relied on 2019 data because of the pandemic. Um, we did commission Scotsen to do some digging into the data for us. So we've got some data that wasn't published in that about mental health and smoking. And the current uh, tobacco control map from the Scottish government is the uh, tobacco and vaping roadmap, which is a 10 year strategy with two year implementation plans. And smoking and mental health doesn't feature in it except for a brief mention. So I think after today, we may have to be working on where they go with the next two year implementation plan and making this much more of a priority than it currently is. Now, we did succeed in getting the Scottish Government to mention 
smoking in its 10 year 2017 mental health strategy. And it set out an ambition to reduce smoking rates in that group in line with reductions in the overall population. But then they did a 2023 update and quietly dropped that commitment. And when we asked them, they said, well, we feel we've met it. Um, I'm not convinced, but we'll work on the tobacco and vaping strategy. And like Colette, we're waiting for the UK legislation to come back. But meantime, Ash Scotland has been asked to convene a short life working group to look at how well or otherwise the smoke-free perimeters around NHS Scotland buildings have been working and mental health issues have already come up at the first meeting as part of that discussion. So adult prevalence trends in Scotland, we do map uh, by deprivation category, which is five different communities uh, in Scotland by income and socioeconomic deprivation. Uh, like everyone, covid Swipe, sideswiped our figures, but the important line um, is the one in the middle, the current adult prevalence for smoking, 16 plus, is 15%. And about 1% of that is accounted by people for by people with a probable mental health condition. So the other thing to say is that the number of people who report having a mental health disorder doubled uh, between 2011 and 2022. And uh, the greatest increase was young, among young adults. So there's a real issue going on there. And uh, the people are reporting higher anxiety, depression, self-harming. And there's not a clear understanding of that, although the pandemic is probably a factor within it. And these are some graphics from our report. Uh, so we know overall in the UK, one in three people with mental health issues smoke. Overall in Scotland, it's, it's two thirds of smokers that say they would prefer not to be smokers. And that's the same or higher among people with mental health issues. Um, and the smoking prevalence among people with mental health issues is about double those without. When we did our report on 2019 figures, in Scotland, the smoking prevalence among people with long-term mental health issues was 31% with an average population prevalence of 17%. Scott's then very kindly ran the figures for us again ahead of this seminar. Um, and they've said it's about 20% now compared to a 15% average, but that's not because smoking rates have gone down. It's because mental health issues and problems have increased. So you're looking at a smaller piece of a bigger jigsaw. And of course, like smoking, we know is closely patterned with socioeconomic deprivation, smoking prevalence among people with mental health issues, scarily high, and uh, some conditions such as um, psychosis, even uh, higher. So this probably takes a bit of unpacking, which we don't have time for, but the black line in the middle is the national average, 15%. You can see that the orangey line uh, is higher, and that's people who smoke and have a psychiatric condition. And the top and bottom lines are the uh, top blue, most, uh, um, sorry, the bottom green, most affluent uh, fifth of our society in Scotland, um, where they're actually beating the curve. And the top is the fifth most deprived communities in Scotland, the fifth quintile, the most deprived communities in Scotland. And you can see that they're absolutely being slammed by the disadvantages of smoking, having a mental health condition, and also um, living in one of our poorest communities in Scotland. So we do have an issue and it does need to be looked at and addressed. So in Scotland, we do give free NRT with our smoking cessation services. Um, we found that some medical professionals don't feel that they're doing people a favor if they raise uh, the issue of smoking with people with a mental health condition. But then we've come across that in the past with youth workers and midwives. And uh, you know that is a lack of understanding and a lack of confidence perhaps. We know, and it has been said already, that uh, tobacco smoking impacts how you met metabolize medicines and antipsychotics are a prime example of that. We know of one health board out of 12 in Scotland that has a specialist smoking cessation and mental health practitioner. So shout out to Lanarkshire there. Um, and research shows that smoking is no uh, plus. It may feel like self-medication for people, but it doesn't help 
people who have a mental health condition and quitting smoking raises your um, well-being, reduces your depression, anxiety and stress. And of course, it can help with financial pressures, another great source for people, a, a huge source of um, mental ill health. And as I said, we've already had mental health facilities come up as an issue, an authority issue as part of our discussions on how well or otherwise the smoke-free perimeters in around NHS Scottish hospitals since 2022 are working. We've also been asked to make recommendations to the Scottish Government for further extension of smoke-free. And we would be suggesting uh, from an Ash Scotland perspective, the aerosol free should become part of that. So smoke and aerosol free environments, safe environments that include both e-cigarettes and heated tobacco and the new heated herbal products. So e-cigarettes, uh, we don't have all the research in, but the what we have seen suggests there's a growing body of research that suggests e-cigarettes aren't great for mental health either, and therefore I would expect that extends to any aerosol-producing nicotine product and probably other nicotine products, such as pouches. We're hearing strong concerns from parents and schools about mental health and well-being and focus and concentration that are linked to uh, pupils vaping. And we have a whole school's approach to a tobacco policy, we recently updated it to include e-cigarettes. The link is in the notes for my slide. And I'll leave it there because probably a lot of the meat of this will be in the discussion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila. Lovely to get the perspective uh, from Scotland. Uh, very uh, important as well, that data you have around the interface between mental Ill health and, and, and deprivation. Um, I'm going now going to move on to our, our last contributor, who is Claire Waters from uh, Public Health Wales. Uh, and this will be your last reminder if you have any questions to put them in the Q&A, because I'll be using those to frame some of our discussions. So thank you very much, uh, Claire, for coming today and for sharing the perspective uh, from, from Wales and from Public Health Wales. Really looking forward to, to hearing your perspective on this topic. So uh, off you go. So hi everyone, I'm Claire Waters. I am full of a cold today, so please excuse my croaky voice. So I'm a principal practitioner. I work for Public Health Wales, working on tobacco control and specifically leading on aspects of our Help Me Quit in Hospital programme. And my presentation today will focus on enhancing workforce knowledge and shifting attitudes, specifically in inpatient mental health settings. So in terms of current prevalence, so a national survey for Wales collects data on smoking prevalence of adults who report that they have a long-standing mental health condition. And our current rates for 22-23 are 27%, and that's double the prevalence of our adult population 16 plus, which is currently at 12.6% in Wales. Unfortunately, we're not able to look at data trends for this population group, and that's due to changes in the way in which data was collected for our national survey pre and post pandemic, which is a shame, um, and it makes our data kind of non-comparable. Non but this is a work stream that we are focusing on, so we need to ensure that we have accurate information for this population group in terms of targeting and also monitoring of changes going forward. So in terms of current initiatives in Wales, <clears throat> the 1st of September uh, 2022 saw all mental health units in Wales become smoke free. And this was an addition, in addition to our smoke free hospital legislation, which came into force on the 1st of March 2021. And this gave mental health units a 18 month period to put plans in place to become smoke free settings. The legislation referred to indoor spaces only and did it include an exemption for designated outdoor smoking areas for use by patients on grounds of mental health units. But that had to comply with wider smoke free hospital legislation. So if a mental health unit sat within a smoke free hospital that made the decision to not go down the smoke free shelter route, then that meant the mental health setting also couldn't explore that option. Um, and a recent map and exercise in Wales showed that there was no health boards that had gone down the smoking shelter route, no shelters at all, um, and that included obviously our, our mental health units. However, five out of seven mental health units did allow vaping, 
in outdoor spaces only. So in terms of the strategic context, so in um, Wales, we have the Welsh Government's Tobacco Control Strategy, Smoke Free Wales, which outlines three priority areas, so health in, uh, reducing health inequalities being one of them, and people with mental health conditions being a priority group within this priority area. So therefore, a very high profile for this population group within Wales and within our policy. We have our Help Me Quit in Hospital programme which again was a Welsh Government directive, which included the creation of a bespoke model for Wales and a three-year implementation plan. The model was created and launched in 2021. The model starts at pre-admission and follows the patient through to post-discharge. The model includes routine ascertainment and recording of smoking status, a very brief advice conversation, provision of NRT, both for a quit attempt and for temporary abstinence and a referral to help me quit cessation services, whether that's in hospital support or post community support or both. To support the rollout of the implementation model, a number of work streams were implemented, which included a comms and engagement strategy with both public and professional facing comms. So I've included an example of some of our materials that were launched as part of a digital toolkit for key stakeholders across Wales. We also produced a training package, which was aimed at all secondary care staff to equip them with the skills and knowledge to be able to best support smokers in secondary care and to deliver elements of the Help Me Quit in Hospital model. <clears throat> the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Wales have recently undertaken a review of smoking and mental health in Wales and produced a framework for action. The three priority areas <coughs> for action included addressing misperceptions about smoking in mental health settings, to improve implementation of quitting strategies in mental health settings, and to address the lack of data on smoking and quitting among people with severe mental illness. So this has provided us with some really good insight that we can use to develop our, our programmes and our initiatives. So training is one of my lead areas and we're currently working on a add-on model to our generic, generic Help Me Quit in Hospital training programme, which is a bespoke training package for those working in, um, in inpatient mental health settings. And we're currently working with the Welsh Government to mandate the training package for all secondary care staff who are working within these settings. OK, so developing a training package for healthcare professionals to best support inpatient smokers in acute mental health settings. So within Wales, we have a well-established Help Me Quit in Hospital programme board, which has a workforce development subgroup. So this provided us with a governance structure and a well-placed group of representative colleagues and stakeholders across Wales that could take this work forward. So I've listed some of the memberships of that group. And to guide the, mod the module content, we undertook a number of insight gathering exercises. So each year we hold an annual Help Me Quit Network event in which we invite all key stakeholders across Wales involved, anyone involved or interested in smoking cessation. I held a breakout session within this event where we gathered information on the barriers and opportunities for this group, both community um, mental health, but also focusing on inpatient settings. I also undertook a scoping exercise, a, a survey to map out current practices within these settings. Um, and this included gathering information on things such as their position on vaping, provision of NRT, whether VBA conversation was common practice and where the smoking cessation support was available um, within that unit. And of course, we took on board the outcomes and recommendations of the review by the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Wales. And using all this information and insight, we developed a theory of change framework, which we used to provide a clear description of what we wanted to achieve and the most efficient way of getting there. This is our theory of change model. And this provided us with a roadmap to ensure that the training programme for healthcare professionals working in acute mental health settings was strategic, evidence-based and outcome-focused. 
helped clarify the path from training to our desired impact, which included an improved smoking cessation support and a cultural shift in attitudes towards how smoking is addressed within this population group. So the mental health module content has been has, has now been developed. It's been signed off by a Help Me Quit and Hospital Programme Board. The training will be an online interactive package utilising our electronic staff records system. Um, and as mentioned, we're working with, with Welsh Government for them to mandate the training for all secondary care staff working within these settings across Wales. The training will include an introduction animation with a voiceover from our mental health clinical champion, which will set the scene for the training, address misperceptions and highlight the value and importance of prioritising the smoking cessation for this population group. The training will include key information required to be able to best support our inpatient smokers and will include a conversation guide as to how to approach the topic of smoking in a non-judgmental way. These are our learning objectives here. We also plan to do some evaluation of the training by inserting a very short pre and post training survey which will enable us to assess knowledge transfer and any shifts in attitudes or beliefs pre and post training. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I've included my contact details if anybody wanted any further information you'd be very welcome to contact me. So thank you very much. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Claire. Uh, you have great structure and governance in uh, in Wales and how you approach this. And uh, I, I I think that's it's it's it looks very it looks very impressive in terms of the of the the process that you're you're setting out on in the in the mental health services. So I think um, I'll definitely be be taking another another uh, another look at that. Um, I think um, you know there's been lots of different types of work that's gone on and different types of good examples you know some you know and um, the work in Northern Ireland in terms of you know listening to the to the people delivering stop, stop smoking and the trusts is very important that perspective and um, listening to the to the to mental health service users the data piece very important as well and um, the system changes around health data how that can sort of capitalize on helping us better understand and uh, get referrals uh, from the system. I think the guidance documents for the health services around tobacco free campus and around smoking and mental health. So there's lots of examples of really, um, really useful uh, initiatives. As I said, we'll, we will put uh, together a uh, a set of the slides and also um, a, a sort of directory of some of the resources that are available across the different jurisdictions. I'll put a little bit of structure on that to make it more accessible and we'll circulate that uh, around to the, to everyone who uh, attended today. So um, thank you very much to all our speakers. I am now going to move on to uh, the uh, discussion and put to you some of the questions that have come up in our, uh, our Q&A. Um, uh, there is a question uh, uh, in relation to um, people with serious um, mental illness. Um, uh, I'm wondering whether anyone would like to comment on the sort of sex and gender differences regarding uh, smoking cessation for people with, with mental illness. Is there any observations or insights um, that we have in that? Do we know enough about it? Or is there any catering in, in, in relation to sort of those gender differences around uh, mental illness? Um, I guess it touches a little bit as well on, on the smoking and pregnancy piece as well, where we know um, there's a high proportion of mental illness around people who, who uh, continue to smoke in pregnancy as well. So um, I'm not going to target anyone. I, do, I, I don't know enough about it to give us a, a sensible reply. Um, has, have, have you looked at this or is there any comments you might like to put forward? Any of my expert panel? Well, I can come in there. Or, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sheila and then Martina. No, no, no. I've got no problem. Um, we we haven't looked at that, and it would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, we I asked Ashling actually our evidence and information officer to just pull some data from our own system, our quit manager patient management system, just to see how many people um with you know who who identify as having a mental health difficulty that come to our service are we seeing and it was only 11 percent um mm -hmm. but uh, but it didn't it, we wouldn't have kind of the data within it to kind of define what kind of a mental health uh, condition they had so i think you'd need to do a specific study around that um but it's an interesting one um maybe sheila has more insight 
No, I was actually just going to say we don't have the basic data that we need, so we don't. Okay. We haven't got the ability to break it down, but I do think the comment about smoking in pregnancy is an interesting one and maybe a good place to start with better data. Okay, great. Colette? Like yourselves, we don't have anything specific, but I think um, following today, I can certainly go back I to our colleagues. We've lost... and... Oh, sorry. Your audio was a bit quiet there, Colette, if you wouldn't mind just repeating from the start there. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we don't have the specific data, but I will discuss with my colleagues in the Southeastern Trust to see what is possible to pull out of a co Encompass. Um, I won't have access to Encompass as a trust-based service, but um, my understanding of it is, I mean, you could pull out by gender, you could pull out by mental health diagnosis, you could pull out, and we, we have already um, negotiated that there is a stop smoking and a smoking cessation piece that has been piloted within Encompass. So they did speak to us prior to Encompass going live because um, we were very much pushing them that to include the data and the figures to see how this how useful this could be. So we're in the early stages, but I'm quite optimistic that we would start to get some really good data um, and for yourselves as well in the Institute, Helen. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be brilliant to, to, to be able to deep dive into that with our trust colleagues to yeah. see uh, what we can learn from that system and what that tells us. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, so I have quite a few questions around perceptions, uh, perceptions among people who have men mental health about um, tobacco use in terms of uh, escapism, in terms of coping with the mental health symptoms that they may be having or just general life stresses um, and what we may need, what what approaches we can take to um, altering their understanding of what smoking is, is, is doing for them and not doing for them in terms of their, their mental health. And also a question around that sort of um, social norms around uh, smoking um as um a coping strategy within as one of the ways you cope with your your mental health symptoms or your 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 mental illness um and obviously some of that perception is also part of the um framing of uh service providers about how the benefit they feel they're going to bring to their their uh, service users around bringing up this conversation around around smoking and um, a risk of doing harm potentially to somebody's mental health status um, or um, creating additional burden on a, on, on a patient who's already struggling with their with with mental health symptoms. So um, I suppose the question is, um, how can we approach that conversation? Um, and that and changing those and changing those perceptions um, and how confident are we uh, in doing that? Is that awareness campaigns? Is that training for professionals? Is that direct communication with people with mental ill health? Um, so that's that. This is a really tricky question, um, but it's probably an elephant in the room. So I'll hand over to, to Sheila's put her hand up very bravely to answer that question. <laughs> Well, fortunately, we uh, commissioned some work with the University of Aberdeen and Turning Point Scotland in a very socioeconomically deprived part of the northeast of Scotland and talked to people. We ran some deep dive sessions. Um, I think it's uh, uh, very participatory research. And what those people were telling us, and they looked at some of the approaches from local services, which they hadn't heard of when they Googled stop smoking services, they got London coming up. But when they looked at the materials, they said, don't tell us that you're taking things away. Don't tell us we can pay the fuel bills. Tell us that we will get something good. So I think we have to figure out what smoking is giving people. And we have to figure out how to sell the get something good bit. They said, you know, tell us that we can afford a pair of trainers or a holiday in the Bahamas after a year or whatever. And they, they, they underlined how important this was as a coping strategy in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we have to understand better what it means to people and how we sell the good stuff that they can get by quitting, because it is a false friend and it puts you on the roller coaster and people don't always understand that. OK, great. Any other feedback from the panel, Claire? 
Hi, yeah, so that's one of our learning objective number one is around kind of raising awareness and understanding of these misperceptions. Um, we've done a load of insight gathering to kind of outline what those misperceptions are and then to kind of tackle them head on. So in our training, you know, there'll be a number of slides around myth busting and then actual kind of the actual facts in terms of the science or the information that we know but also an accompanying comms campaign and exactly as Sheila's um, just described so uh, all, all our messaging in the game framed messaging so not what they're gonna okay. lose but what do they gain from becoming smoke free however okay. that's kind of you know a reduction in their you know dosage of the medication um, the mm -hmm. smoke free health benefits etc so that yeah that's the route that we're taking in ways okay great uh, so i have um, a few questions about um, the role of harm reduction and the role of e-cigarettes in relation to people with uh, mental um, ill health um, as a support to uh, to stop smoking um, uh, in terms of uh, providing vapes to people who smoke within a mental health hospital um, or uh, using the service. So uh, I know this is sometimes a topic where we have differences of opinion across the UK and Ireland in various different settings, um, but uh, I would maybe invite uh, any of our panelists who want to respond to, to, that, to that question. Colette, and then Sheila. <laughs> Yeah, this. I mean, the, it's the point of having these conversations. There's no point in getting together and and telling each other all the nice stuff. We need to be talking about the challenges. That's where the help and and support across each mm -hmm. of, of our systems really comes to the fore. For us, it's a no, and um, we do not provide vapes as part of our stop smoking offering uh, in any setting. Um, we acknowledge that some people do use vapes, but we don't provide them directly. So we will provide a range of nicotine replacement therapy, but it does include uh, e-cigarettes at this point in time. So it's something we keep constantly under review, um, yeah. but not at the moment. So yeah. just- and Could I ask, Claire, I mean, in terms of uh, pe uh, people who um, use, use tobacco and vapes or who just vape, can they still access uh, cessation support through the usual channels? Yes, so at the moment, we our services are stop smoking services. Uh -huh. but we have over six, 460 pharmacy based services across uh -huh. Northern Ireland and we have trust services and we run an open door policy. We don't turn anybody away. If somebody is looking to reduce their addiction to nicotine or quit their addiction to nicotine, uh, it's not a stop vaping service, but we are supporting people. And currently we're looking at a piece of work to see what are we looking in the new strategy at a stop vaping service um, okay so there's a lot of development in the space um, yeah and, and but we don't we will run on the the policy of not really turning anybody away if somebody's come and seeking help you don't really want to be closing the door okay great um sheila and then martina thank you so uh you're probably aware but the WHO published the first guideline on evidence-based adult tobacco cessation treatment in July this year. And they have some very good evidence-based recommendations. They haven't included e-cigarettes because the evidence-based population level strategy is not strong enough. Now I'm aware there are some strong voices in Scotland and England arguing that these devices should be made available. But if, um, when I've looked at the Cochrane Living Review funded by CIUK policy, it only looks at claimed effectiveness and it finds just a shade difference for e-cigarettes as opposed to conventional NRT. And I don't think we've reached the bottom of combination NRT treatment, um, let alone the additional health risks and um, you know aerosol risks and risks to people picking up uh, this as a normal product to be using. So Scotland's approach is we only recommend prescription products. There's no e-cigarette anywhere on prescription, but we support people where they're starting from. So if they're starting from a user, I want to use vapes, then we start with them and what can we offer them? But the recommendation is only for on prescription products. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, great. Uh, Martina? Yep, and uh, very similar here. We um, looked at e-cigarettes as a cessation aid within the clinical guidelines. There's no recommendation for e-cigarettes at the moment, so we don't provide them um, through our services. 
That said, we work with people where they're at and if they uh, come in dual users or vapor, vaping only, we still support them with behavioral support. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, or if they if they want to quit tobacco and use uh, a, an e-cigarette despite us recommending combination NRT, um, we still support them. So that's what we do. Okay, great. And could I just ask as well, if somebody is also, um, you know, using cannabis um, or other substances, they're still eligible to, to access free stop so support through the, through the, through the statutory schemes? Absolutely. Yeah, for us, anyway. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I have a question here, a very interesting question <laughs> um, on language. Um, and how we refer to people with uh, mental ill health, and um, particularly those with serious mental illness or chronic enduring mental illness, um, and how uh, how people identify in terms of of having um, you know a mental illness. Um, so I, this question, I suppose, is around what language we what do we what have we learned or what do we know or do we know anything <laughs> about the language that we can use to encourage people with with mental illness to access stop smoking supports um and to help them believe or understand or trust the service that 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 that, that it will help them to be successful in their in their quit attempt um how is the current language using the campaigns landing with people with with uh, with mental illness um is there any adaptations we would need or do we need to reflect on, on the, the language that we're using um, to to engage people with serious mental illness to 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 access the supports that are available? Sheila? Uh, so I think we need to go back to the people that we're talking about and see what's acceptable to them. And we have done that through um, charities representing people with mental ill health in Scotland for the 2022 report. We haven't done it recently, but we have been to those communities living in deprivation in the northeast of Scotland and said, how do you want us to refer to this? And they said, don't talk about poverty because that depresses us. Talk about socioeconomic okay. depression because okay. uh, socioeconomic deprivation, because that makes clear that we're living in circumstances that aren't necessarily under our control or of our making. OK, but I think I think going back to people is key because people living in those circumstances often feel quite powerless and mm -hmm. just asking them is is powerful yeah and i guess the stigma of mental illness and to agree to a degree the stigma stigmatizing view that people may have around people who smoke are kind of issues that you really need to try and cut through in relation to the design of campaigns and the design uh, design of services um colette do you have a comment there uh, just just what sheila said it certainly resonates with us and um, very, you know, recently in all our engagement with communities who we class as experiencing social and economic disadvantage, they are reminding us how powerful language is and they have said, please stop. And we've said, OK. And, and, and given that it's World Mental Health Day, they want us to work with them to inspire hope. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, look at the positives in a community. So I think I think it's we, we need to. We, we have a language in health and policy that's about the negative and it's how do we okay. still uh, focus on, you know, the opportunity and the positive without being twee about it, really, I suppose. But it's really about meeting people where they're at um, and engaging with with people and making sure that you target your messaging. Um, uh, social media is uh, is massively influential and there's a lot of um, community-based organisations or voluntary sector organisations who really know how to communicate with their target audience. So I think it's that partnership work uh, and partnership approach to ensuring that services are raised with folks in a way that suits them at a time that suits them. Um, so it's really about the stop smoking clinic practitioners out there Um knowing the people they work with and then being able to sign post. But it, it, I suppose it's a challenge we're all on. But I think how do we flip the conversation to make it one of hope, I think, at the moment is, is coming through loud and clear in many of our engagements with community voluntary sector at the moment. Um, okay. And they're they're actually rewriting their own strategic plans with a very positive mm -hmm. slant on them. I, I was at an event last week and the strategic plan for a very deprived and disadvantaged community is full of hope and aspiration it 
it's not about mm-hmm. tackling disadvantage. So I think there's a lot to be learned from working with other people. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. So I have a question here, just in terms of um, uh, uh, if you're if I was um in charge of. Uh, all of the departmental budgets, which sometimes people think I am, but I can assure you I'm not. <laughs> um, but if your budget was was increased, what would be your priority investment? What, where would you invest that extra money in relation to smoking among people with mental ill health? Um, um, so I suppose that's a that's a question of you know, the priorities that you would most like to see move forward? Is it training? Is it campaigns? Is it community groups? Is it data? Is it research? Is it listening exercises? Is it working with the mental health charities and and services? Or um, uh, is it something else entirely? So I'm just interested in your in your sort of views on that. We won't hold you hold you to it. <laughs> but I guess it's a question that that for people trying to sort of Prioritize. You can't do everything all at once to unknit such a very, very complicated um, issue for uh, issue for people. Um, tobacco dependence is is difficult to to treat and manage, um, as is uh, a lot of mental illness. So you know, um, this is not a, a an area. I think we will still be talking about this area as long as we're talking about tobacco control and smoking cessation. We'll be talking about mental health and in that space. So. Um, just give you a bit, a bit of time there with some waffle from me to, to uh, think about your, <laughs> about your priorities. So, oh, Colette, Colette, straight in. <laughs> I know what I would do straight away. I would reinstate our, mor- we have a moratorium at the minute on campaigns in Northern Ireland, so we can't spend any of our money on campaigns. We have very okay. strong... We have very strong evidence that every time we run a campaign, providing it's... Um, a mass media campaign but it really speaks to your target audience we see yeah. a very clear increase in foot faulty services okay. um, and we've seen the gap when we're, we haven't been able to to do those so certainly that would be one of the one of the things we would look to be reinstated okay okay great uh, martina yeah if if we got a ball of money i think i think we'd put it into to staff um particularly okay. that are working in mental health um I, I think the idea of kind of a targeted campaign with the gain framed messaging is really interesting, actually. Um, you know, we talked about kind of, I suppose, breaking down the barriers and kind of the understanding around the challenges in quitting. And throughout our general campaign, we kind of do that by by kind of talking about, you know, it's a non-judgmental service. We know quitting is hard, mm-hmm. you know, kind of talking to the client. Um, you know, we've been there. We'll help you through it. Come back to us again. Try again that kind of messaging um but i think we could probably do something specific but if we had the staff we could get them to do it um to do a bit of of kind of i suppose more training with me- with mental health professionals themselves um a- around around smoking and um in, in and mental health and the interaction and kind of i suppose encouraging them to refer and engage um in 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 getting getting people into the service um so that's that's what we do um if we had if we had extra money but uh, we do put in bids um almost every year um i feel for, you do <laughs> yeah you're, yeah you're fed up looking at them you probably get a look at them do you <laughs> No, I just, you I don't. just know the, I just know the bun fight that goes on in relation yes, to, uh, in absolutely. relation to resourcing. So it is, it is a challenge. Um, Sheila, did you have a comment there? Yeah, just to say, um, and I'm sure it's a common refrain across all of us. There's no money. Scottish government has no money for anything except possibly the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, but that's another <laughs> issue. So I think we have to be very cute with what we do have. I think we have to take opportunities to engage with professionals to raise the level of knowledge and confidence through, you know, presentations and and conferences and things. I think we have to take the opportunity for dialogue where we can with community groups, with people impacted by what we're talking about to keep it rooted in the reality. And I think we have to think about using existing hooks like No Smoking Day, which is always the second Wednesday in March. You know, do we want to have some messaging around that, for example, that would raise this issue and and could be kind of amplified by local services and used by them as a way of reaching out? So I suppose my my one thing is, um, yeah, the extra money would be great, but can we actually do some hard thinking about maximising the use of it through things that cost less? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, Claire, any comments? Yeah, I, I think quite similar to the others, really. But if, yeah. Yeah, if we had a, a pot of money, then I think it would be definitely a, a specialist team for dedicated to this population group. Within Wales, we have community specialists, we have hospital specialists, and we have maternity specialists. Well, then why not the mental health specialist team? Um, mm -hmm. And also um, an, an adaptation to our cessation model, which isn't, which, you know, we know it shouldn't be a one size fits all, but we're, um, and we know the extra challenges this this group has in particular. So a model that would flex to the challenges of the group, I think, would be on my list. OK, great. Uh, just to clarify, I don't have the money before we <laughs> leave this world of conversation. Uh, Colette? You don't have money, but I have hope that sometimes we can do things with less. Um, yeah. Because sometimes we have to. So we've been forced to kind of be quite innovative. And... Um, last weekend so when we went when the, the tobacco and vape spill was coming out in the big uk wide consultation of an, an advance of it we were trying to see could we really encourage public responses to that document thought mm -hmm. this is so vital for where to shape the future of northern ireland knowing the strategy was coming to an end knowing that we were going into a new space and we couldn't do any sort of televised campaign or anything like that. So we started to get really creative and we brought our community voluntary sector reps together with us. And I can see Naomi from Cancer Focus NI is on the call uh, on the webinar and Naomi would have been heavily involved in this. But what we did was we developed um, social media messaging and we all got ourselves together and we accessed the full network of social media that we had through mostly through our community voluntary sector, to be fair, mm -hmm. because the health sector network wasn't going to have the same reach as the community voluntary se sector network. So we agreed the messages and really um, went hard at it to get a good Northern Ireland response. And actually the comms team picked up an award last at the weekend with and it, and it got the best Northern Ireland social media award. Um, for innovation and creativity in social media campaign. Not my work, a collective, <laughs> right? It's collective. Yeah. Um, it was a collective approach, but it just goes to show you sometimes where there's a will, there's definitely a way. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so we're coming to the end and I guess I'm gonna have, there's, there's two questions uh, that I'd like to, I see some of them are being touched on a little bit in, in the chat. Uh, one of them relates to that specialist role um, I think Sheila mentioned, was it Lanarkshire have a specialist role in place in relation to stop smoking and mental health services? Um, um, is there of what do you see as the additional value of that role? How's it how's it going? How did you get it? And, <laughs> and do you have any uh, insights in terms of the sort of value risk benefits of, of those sorts of specialized roles um, going forward? So I can put you in touch with someone at NHS yeah. Lanarkshire and they would they, they do very good thorough strategic planning and evaluation and they uh -huh. judge this was a very good investment. They also uh -huh. have cessation and pregnancy specialist. So mental right. health and pregnancy are the two areas of focus. Um, and I think that's quite exciting. They have high levels of deprivation in some communities. So right. probably the short answer is I'll put you in touch with someone that can tell you more on okay, that. Okay. But this this development of those specialist roles was in the context of a high deprivation area. Yes, I think so. Ah, and okay. it was a health yeah. board that is on the front foot with tobacco control issues. So I think okay. our 12 health boards take different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, some actively offer vaping cessation, some mm -hmm. don't. Okay. And um, Lanarkshire is particularly, I think, active and strong with this area. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and a question, I suppose, around the, the training modules, because I think each of the uh, uh, jurisdictions has, has a training module around mental health and smoking. Uh, do you have any insights on engagement with that training training module? Um, uh, do you get good engagement or, or or do you get engagement from the people that you would most like to see doing that course? <laughs> um uh, and just any any feedback you've had on the training modules? Is it all the same training module that we offer, in, in or very different variations? Um, so uh, this will be my final question before I close off our, our session because I know we have gone a little bit over, but I think it, it's it's a good one to end it on. So would anyone like to go first to go first to talk about the the training module, Kellett? I want to highlight there that um, some of the work 
short on time, but um, Naomi has put the link in on the chat function there, so we will share it with folks. But there is a mental health stop smoking a mental health course that we do commission and delivered through Cancer Focus, and it's online, mm -hmm. so you can have a look at it there. And Naomi will be able to get us some figures on terms of numbers of folks going through. Um, right. But again, it's another part of the offering that we would be mm -hmm. making sure that staff are aware that, that this is available and try and, um, and look at uptake of it. Um, so it's there. It's it's just about spreading the word as well and, and, and helping people to identify why it's of interest to them to do that training module. Yeah. OK, great. Thanks, Colette. Uh, Martina? Yeah, we have um, a specific module on smoking and mental health that we've adapted from NCSET in the UK. Um, and Irishified. Um, so that's for um, stop smoking advisors um, to kind of do. Um, we also developed new um, medication uh, or training on stop smoking medication. And we have a, a section in there um, covering mental health that's kind of more widely available now for our healthcare professionals to try and support clinical guideline implementation. Um, and that's on HC land. It's kind of a shorter training, kind of 40, 45 minutes. Um, so it's better. Hope, we're hoping that there'll be better access to that. And then we have obviously brief intervention, making every contact count training as well. Um, and just, just there was a question in the chat about whether we've trained kind of mental health staff as stop smoking advisors, and we have done that. Um, and, you know, to varying degrees of success, you know, a lot of the time when they go back to their substantive post, they get pulled into, into other work. And, and unless there's dedicated time, it can be eroded to this, this service and this, mm -hmm. you know, delivery, which is a challenge. Okay, thanks for sharing that, Martina. Sheila, do you want to talk about the training in Scotland? Um, yeah, at the moment, the uh, NCSET is being commissioned in to do some training. And when that originally happened, they were meant to align with Scotland's approach, which I think may have drifted with staff changes a bit. So, um, I think in an ideal world, and picking up on one of the questions in the chat, we would not be uh, putting forward what they put forward on e-cigarettes. Um, okay. That is just not the Scotland's position. So um, I'd have to go away and find out a bit more about what's actually happening. I'm not okay. engaged with the training at national level. Okay, great. Thanks, Sheila. Claire, do you have any comment on the training in, in Wales? Yeah, so um, so as mentioned, we have our All Wales training package, which isn't uh -huh. aimed at smoking cessation practitioners. It's aimed at all secondary care staff. And it's around, it's kind of like a v, um, brief intervention plus. So it's to be able to identify our smokers, to make them comfortable, provision of NRT, et cetera, and a referral onto our smoking cessation service. So every hospital has a team of smoking cessation practitioners that will come in and support our inpatients. So we are, uptake hasn't been amazing. Mm -hmm. So we've launched this year are always training um but welsh government it was a welsh government directive and they are working with health boards to mandate that training so that will okay. be a really positive step for us and the training that i was i was talking about uh, in my presentation is a bespoke package for secondary care staff working in inpatient settings again not to provide the smoking cessation to the patients but to be able to support them manage withdrawal keep them comfortable and refer on to our special staff that will come in and provide that more detailed specialist support to them okay great thank you very much um so i'm going to close off today's session we've run over a little bit but i think the the inputs were really um really really useful and the discussion has been has been very useful and surfaced a lot of the real issues in terms of um smoking cessation services so um i'm going to commit to sending you out the slides uh, everyone who's attended and registered today and also a little directory of some of the resources um that are are being offered across the different jurisdictions to give us some um uh, time to celebrate our achievements um, to reflect on um, st strategic investment and operational decisions uh, going forward. Um, I hope you found it a useful opportunity to, to share what we're doing uh, across different jurisdictions and, and to build our, our relationships. If there are any other topic areas in tobacco uh, and e-cigarette policy that you think it would be beneficial to have another similar workshop on, we, we, we do send that to us and we, and we, can, uh, we can consider it. Um, 
And uh, the last thing I really want to do is to thank uh, Martina, Claire, Colette and Sheila for their inputs and thank everyone for their attention and engagement today. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.